Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. The local time is 847, and we will begin our program on the San Andreas Fault at 9 o'clock, a little more than 10 minutes away from now. So if you're watching this in replay form, go ahead and scroll ahead 12 minutes, I guess. But we start early with the early arrivals, and there's already 200 of you here uh, to visit. And I've got some thank yous this morning and even a little story. So first things first, Michael says we're five by five. Michael, you're always so uh, prompt with those comments on each of these videos after they come through on YouTube. Thank you for that. I always enjoy reading those. Good morning, Japan. Uh, we've got folks from the San Andreas Fault this morning. Uh, San Jose, that's right. Denmark, good morning. Charleston, South Carolina. Hello, Brand uh, Brenda. Yeah, it's quite breezy here this morning. I wanted to be out in the backyard and almost, almost did it, but 25 miles an hour. Kind of tired of dealing with the elements. Uh, we've been doing a fair amount of that the last couple of live streams. So here we are on the front porch this morning. Uh, John, good morning. Garlock Fault. Oh, my God. We got, oh, Santa Cruz. Oh, the pressure's on. Now I actually have to say something meaningful. Uh, Germany, Norway, Scotland, always uh, fun to see you all. Uh, Thomas, hey, how's it going? Uh, in Germany. Good, it looks like we're functional. Okay, I've got, uh, it's been a while since I've uh, broadcast from home here, so I've had some things arrive in the mail that I want to share with you. Uh, we'll, we'll do this quite quickly. Nova Scotia, uh, BC, The Dalles, hello Jackie, Henderson, Nevada. Mountain View, California, yeah, boy, we got, we got Cali in the house. Okay. Thank yous. Marty and Dale, thank you. You left something on the doorstep up by the mudroom. It's a present for Bijou. And uh, I wanted to keep it intact uh, until I got a chance to thank you. And so we'll see if, he's, if he has fun with this. So thank you. He's upstairs screwing around, I think. Box from Portland, Oregon, downtown Portland. I've met Wesley once uh, in person when I was down there last fall giving a talk. So Wesley, I thank you for, oh my God, amazing. Coffee beans from Portland. Wesley, thank you so much. Did you say it was your son maybe that uh, is involved with this uh, roasting facility perhaps? Uh, Regardless, we look, we look very much forward to enjoying that coffee, both Liz and I, so thank you. And this box arrived. Look at the postage on this. Arrived from Thibodeau, Louisiana. John, from Louisiana, from Thibodeau. Thank you for the box of rock samples that we can use in our teaching. Uh, sounds like you're cleaning house, getting rid of some stuff and uh, trying to get some, look at how beautifully packaged this is. And John from Thibodeau uh, sent all sorts of rock samples to use for teaching Samples from Texas, samples from Louisiana, samples from the Gulf. Uh, almost $40 worth of postage for crying out loud. So if you're here right now, John, uh, thank you very much. Sincerely, thank you. 
And uh, it's a small world. My buddy Scott Brady, who teaches at Chico State, who pretended to be Angus age five so that I would answer his question a couple weeks ago. Uh, he's my age and he's a buddy. And he, he, he lived in your neighborhood for a while. I, I forwarded your email to him. He was thrilled to see that. He, his old dad, uh, Glenn Brady, was a, was a football coach back there for many years. Let's look at the schedule. This is the week that was. British Columbia geology happened last Tuesday night. These are all available, of course, in replay form. Uh, we had a guest in the backyard on Wednesday, Andrew Sudowski from Washington Geological Survey. Last Thursday night, I was up on Saddle Rock fighting uh, the elements and had help from Jason and Julie. That was like a field trip up at Saddle Rock above Wenatchee. And then yesterday morning, um, the magical and memorable Randy Lewis. If you haven't seen that one yet, I, I think that you'll enjoy it. And of course, this morning, the San Andreas Fall. So is there a next week? Sure there is. So we'll do the dramatic reveal. The upcoming week, I won't see you tomorrow night, Monday. Uh, we, we take a break from each other. Tuesday night, 6 p.m., June 9th, Spokane Geology. Spokane Geology. So I've gotten emails from a number of you asking for that. Why don't I talk about Spokane? And uh, I got a little story for you. Now we got time. So for years, not just these live streams, but for years, anytime I talk about Spokane area, I have kind of a running joke and I do it very quickly. I don't even explain the running joke, but I always just say John Stockton's house. So like, oh, the west coast of North America wasn't always out at uh, ocean shores, you know, during Pangea time even, the west coast was at, uh, at John Stockton's house. Uh, or, you know, Missoula floods, they, all that water came over John Stockton's house. And, you know, again, uh, you know, people, if they're not a basketball fan or a sports fan like I am, then that just, you know. But let me tell you why I always say John Stockton's house as kind of a reference and almost an inside joke. If there's a sports fan on the other end, they kind of get a chuckle out of it because they know about John Stockton. He went to Gonzaga University. He's exactly my age. Uh... Um, he played at Gonzaga. This is a basketball player we're talking about, John Stockton, and uh, had tremendous success with Utah Jazz in the NBA. Um, even to this day is the career leader in assists and steals. You know, this six foot guy from little Spokane, Washington, dominated the world of basketball as a point guard. And he's right in there with Jordan and, and Barkley and, and Ewing and those guys. They're all, all the same vintage as me. And so I've followed their careers from a distance, of course, the whole way. And, you know, Stockton has returned to Spokane. And there's a uh, Sports Illustrated article about 30 years ago that I really loved, where with all the success, he went back and bought a house next door to his parents' house where he grew up. Uh, modest house. And he would live there in the summers and with the plan of going back to Spokane and, and living. So he lives in Spokane. His, two of his kids played at Gonzaga. So you watch a Gonzaga game and there's the obligatory shot of John Stockton in the audience. Okay, why am I telling you this story? Can you guess? Got home yesterday afternoon from my morning with Randy Lewis in Wenatchee. sent on Thursday, third person Thursday.
So John, if this really is you, if you really actually did this, thank you. I'll treasure this forever. It's a thrill. And Dale, if it's you or somebody else who's punking me, you can't play with my heart like this. I love this guy. It's like my mother, John Stockton, Liz, my boys, okay? In that order. So you can't play with me like that. So if, if this is a prank, I need to hear from who did this. But if it's not a prank, thank you. All right, we doing okay? Who else we got here? I got two minutes. Liz is out on a walk, a long walk, so she doesn't need to hear my voice for the next hour and a half. Switzerland, hey man, good to see you again. Iowa, Germany. Hey, we got a topic that I think everybody knows about. Everybody's heard of the San Andreas Fault, haven't they? Around the world. So I expect we'll have a maybe a bigger uh, than normal uh, audience this morning. Manu in Belgium, hello. Toronto, Cameron. England, Mark, hello. Yorkshire, Yorkshire. India. Terrific to have you. Another England. Distant places always makes my heart go flutter, flutter. What? Check my laptop real quick. Seems like we're functional, huh? Oh, I want to finish the schedule, sorry. I got carried away with my Stockton story. Well, I'm, I'm, it's like Tiger Beat Magazine, you know? Maybe I should like, yeah, I should probably hang, hang that um, Stockton thing, okay. So that's Tuesday night in honor of John Stockton, and I won't overdo it, I promise, on Tuesday. Wednesday, George Beck, very famous geologist here in Washington, will tell his story. Thursday, a very famous geologist named Israel Russell. I know nothing about him, but he is back in the, in the era of George Otis Smith. So if you like the George Otis Smith show, not for everybody, I realize. Um, if you like the George uh, show, I think you'll enjoy, enjoy this one. Saturday morning, Kittitas Valley. I've got a trick up my sleeve or two. That's the valley that I live in, Kittitas Valley, geology. And then uh, I guess we're doing it. Next Sunday, I guess we're doing it. I got some book learning to do. Okay, it's already nine o'clock. That Stockton story took too long. Give me a minute, would you? And then we'll get started. Thank you for joining us this morning. Well, a pleasant good morning to you all. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington. We're not in California this morning. This isn't a field trip down in the Carrizo Plain, but we're going down there mentally, and we will be in the Cozy Fort a fair amount this morning. I've got uh, a number of uh, animations and video clips, some of which I haven't seen in uh, 40 years. I'll explain. Um, but um, we are talking about the San Andreas Fault in California this morning, and you're like, well, hold on now. You know, I've watched a bunch of these. 
And you keep saying that you you just want to stay in Washington, like you just want to do the Pacific Northwest, like that, that's kind of your deal. And that's true. But we're doing a San Andreas Fault show for two main reasons. Bunch of emails, why don't you do a San Andreas Fault show? Okay, fine. And secondly, there are some benefits for us to go down to California to better help us understand some of the things we've been talking about here in Washington. I don't know if you can anticipate what that might be. Let me give you a little laundry list of things that I think we might talk about this morning. I'm loose, of course, as always, uh, but we'll, uh, I've got a general plan. So in addition to just uh, for beginners, making sure we know what the San Andreas Fault is and where it is and how it works, uh, we of course will go to a tragic event that happened more than 100 years ago, downtown San Francisco, California. Uh, easily the most famous earthquake in North America's history as far as, research, as far as research is concerned. I'll explain that in a bit. We are going to a place that you may not have heard of called the Carrizo Plain, which I have always taught about. We even have a lab that's built around the California uh, section of the San Andreas Fault called the Carrizo Plain. And I Googled last night. I didn't even realize it was, it's now a national monument. I, didn't, I, didn't, I was impressed by that. So... Um, We'll talk about the significance of the Carrizo Plain, and then in, we're not doing this in order necessarily, but I do want to come back to the Pacific Northwest for a discussion of clockwise rotation and Baja BC, which you know is a, is a favorite of mine for many local reasons, and the San Andreas Fault work, the San Andreas Fault history will, will shed some light on the validity of that. Okay, that's the plan. Now, just for a moment, let's pretend you have all never heard of the San Andreas Fault and you want to know very, very basic things. Or you're a young person learning and doing your homeschooling this morning. What can we talk about with the San Andreas Fault? Well, I go to the other whiteboard and I share this with you. I'm going to tilt it like this so there's not a ton of glare. And so I'll kind of hold back here. I think I'm framed okay. So let me try to just verbally explain what I have on this board for you. First of all, this is the state of California, Nevada, Oregon. Washington is not even on this thing, okay? So my, my front porch is not even on this map this morning. And I have red arrows. Those are tectonic plates. This is the Pacific plate moving a couple inches a year to the northwest. This is the North American plate moving a couple inches a year to the southwest. This is the Juan de Fuca plate moving a couple inches to the northeast three tectonic plates and they actually all come together at this point right here. It's a place on the Northern California coast called Cape Mendocino. In geology we call it the Mendocino Triple Junction. You can actually stand at a place where three tectonic plates come together and obviously that's a very active place for earthquakes because we have not only the San Andreas Fault coming up from the Gulf of California, Baja, Mexico, uh, bending a little bit north of Los Angeles, uh, skirting past downtown San Francisco, and then up to Cape Mendocino. And then here's the, Cape, the uh, San Andreas Fault that, that takes a hard left-hand turn and goes out to the ocean. So the San Andreas Fault does not continue up into the Pacific Northwest. That's a very different type of a plate boundary that we've discussed a fair amount called the Cascadia subduction zone. So you can think of it as a fault as well, but it's a very different kind of a fault. These two faults are very different from each other. So Cascadia, again, I'll do this quick because we've spent a lot of time on this. Cascadia is where the, the ocean plate is diving or subducting beneath the Pacific Northwest. So there's a trench here, an oceanic trench, a big drop off on the ocean floor. And we're generating these great earthquakes, these magnitude 9 or magnitude 8.5 or maybe magnitude 8 earthquakes that generate huge tsunami. And obviously, it's a very serious situation. We don't have tsunami with the San Andreas Fault because the fault is running through continental crust. And if you haven't heard this before, Los Angeles, California is not on the North American plate. It's on the Pacific plate. So L.A. and San Diego and all these communities on the coast in Southern California, SoCal, those SoCal folks are riding on a different tectonic plate and they're going a different direction. Now, people lost their minds 
1972, let's say, when maps like this started showing up in newspapers and they saw California with a big old crack in it and urban legend quickly took hold and it still holds today. I still talk to people. Oh, when California falls into the ocean, like, like they see this map and do their own math and assume that this is an unstable portion of the state of California that's going to kerplunk into the water one day. That's ridiculous. This is a piece of continental crust that's more than 40 miles thick. It's connected to a plate that goes from here all the way to Tokyo. The Pacific plate is the biggest plate on the planet. You can't just break off a piece and have it fall into the ocean if you understand the depth and the breadth of these tectonic plates. And by the way, this is the North American plate, which is going from uh, the Carrizo Plain, where we'll go just a second, a little bit west of Bakersfield, all the way, the North American plate goes all the way to Reykjavik, Iceland. So this is not just a regular fault, the San Andreas Fault. It's not just a regular crack like the Seattle Fault or the Saddle Mountains Fault or the Fault up by India, the faults we've talked about here in Washington. This is a substantial plate boundary, a transform plate boundary. So we'll come back to this, but let's still setting the tone, especially for new people and young viewers. Each time we have an earthquake on a segment of the San Andreas Fault, I want you to think about these blocks, these wooden blocks. So you're looking down now. You're gonna, this is looking down from an airplane or a helicopter. And I've drawn a fence for you. Let's pretend this is a pasture, a cow pasture, or a ranch in central California, okay? And I'm trying to get this fence lined up. So this is a bunch of, maybe it's a dry area. It's late in the summer. Everything's brown, okay? Just like the top of this, this wooden block. And this is a fence that a rancher put in, I don't know, 100 years ago, let's say, okay? Now, this crack, of course, is the San Andreas Fault. And so when we do have an earthquake on the San Andreas Fault, if this segment of the San, and San Andreas Fault happens to go, the earthquake happens, and this is the kind of motion. It's a clean break, and you're like, oh, come on, it's, this, is just, these are just, this is just props. It's not really that clean. It's not that perfect. It actually is. It is absolutely amazing, and we're going to see photos and a couple of animations to show how cleanly the ground breaks. And Scott Kronk, who may be with us this morning, has spectacular drone footage flying right up and over, basically right going from south to north, and it, honest to God, looks exactly like this in real life. And this is a right lateral fault, meaning that if you approach, if you're walking along the fence, looking backwards into my image here, if you're walking along the fence towards the fault, you finally get to the fault and you go, well, where's the fence? It's gone. You have to look to the right to find the continuation of the fault. And you're like, well, okay, so right lateral, but it doesn't work that way if you walk the other way. It does. If you start over here and start walking along the fence towards the fault this way, you still have to look to the right to find the continuation of the fault, okay? So right lateral fault, this is basically the Pacific plate that's jumping past the North American plate. Now, if I do this in its position, please ignore those just ignore those, these, these red lines, okay? I just want to show you in a horizontal sense what it looks like. So you're, you're down in Mexico. I'm up here in Washington in my front porch. We're going to have an earthquake on the San Andreas Fault. That's it. You see, there's no mountain range. There's no lifting. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing this. I'm just having almost perfect slippage along this transform plate boundary, a.k.a. the San Andreas Fault. Now, the San Andreas Fault is hundreds of miles long. It's not the entire length of the fault that ruptures at once. Instead, there are segments of the fault that rupture um, individually, and so we get complicated in a hurry. So what I'm saying is, yes, the length of this San Andreas Fault, I've already forgotten the number. Did I write it down somewhere?
Yeah, I guess depending on how you measure it, but uh, a conventional number is uh, the entire length of the San Andreas Fault from the Gulf of California down here in Mexico all the way up to Cape Mendocino is 750 miles long. And I'm not saying, and nobody is saying in geology, that there will be an earthquake, the big one that everybody's talking about, where the entire 750 miles does the wooden block trick. There's no field evidence for that. The entire thing is not going to slip at once. But in 1906, we did have a very scary earthquake in downtown San Francisco, but it wasn't just downtown San Francisco. 350 miles, so not 750, I'm sorry, 300 miles, 300 miles, the, the, the northernmost 300 miles of the San Andreas Fault from Cape Mendocino down to, I think it's San Juan Batista. That entire segment ruptured. And the Pacific Plate side of the fault in 1906, in many places, including Point Reyes, just north of San Francisco, moved 20 feet. You want to see it? 20 feet. Now I'm talking about 1906, the northern segment of the San Andreas Fault. Okay, we're minding our own business. I actually have some old, uh, newly discovered footage from downtown San Francisco a couple of days before the great earthquake. And then I also have this exciting footage from two weeks later. Exciting is the wrong word, it's tragic. But I'm talking about that earthquake, 1906. Now, what did I just say? I said that the 300-mile segment of the San Andreas Fault that's in the northern portion, not the entire length, but when the earthquake happened in 1906, here we go. Stress pumped into the rocks, strain building for centuries, and then finally, 20 feet of movement. In other words, a fence, our fence here, is broken cleanly, and the Pacific Plate side of it shifted 20 feet. So I'm not saying the fault ruptures 20 feet every time there's an earthquake. There's variability there. But that 20 feet, I think it's actually technically almost 21 feet, measured in Point Reyes, is the biggest offset that has been measured so far on the San Andreas Fault. Now, speaking of that, let me show you a lab that I wrote with a guy that I used to teach with called Charlie Rubin. Charlie got his PhD at Caltech, uh, the California Institute of Technology, which is kind of uh, one of the main places to uh, generate uh, earthquake scientists. And Charlie was fresh out of that program and came up here to Ellensburg, and uh, we taught a field class. So we were always, I told you about that Owens Valley field class that we used to teach for 20 years. And we'd be teaching students how to map along faults. This is the Owens Valley Fault. Uh, it's kind of a, uh, this is more of a normal fault. This is an offset cinder cone. I'm just showing you a, a, an example of another fault. In the, we know that there's lots of faults in the state of California. But the point is, these fresh faults, meaning these faults that have not been concealed by lavas or uh, uh, eroded back, many of these faults have earthquakes that are recent enough where those, those scars on the landscape are still as fresh as, as it looks like it just happened yesterday, and it kind of did geologically. So I can't remember why we did this, but at some point, maybe 20 years ago, I said, Charlie, you've been doing all this research on the San Andreas Fault, right? Yes, I have. This is me and Charlie talking now in 1998 or something. And I say, well, you, you, you use those, trend, you, you actually trench across the San Andreas Fault. Yes, we do. We rent a backhoe. We have somebody, we hire somebody, uh, truly a backhoe digging perpendicular perpendicular to the trend of the fault. So here's one photograph at the Carrizo Plain where we have a trend of the San Andreas Fault. Again, you can see that there's a linear trace. And so Charlie and his brand, he worked with Kerry C and some others, Tom Rockwell, and there's still people doing this, and they're taking backhoes and digging a trench, just like if they're putting in a, 
a new cable in your front yard, you know, the, 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 the workers come and they, they, they do the big scoop and they dig in. Well, there's backhoe trenching across the fault and then there's excavation, or in other words, cleaning off the walls of that backhoe trench. And then you look for layers that you can absolute age date and try to figure out how many earthquakes there have been on that particular segment of the San Andreas Fault. And it's, a, it's an approach that's been used for 30, 40 years by now. So anyway, I just want to give you a little glimpse because we have a little bit of video from this area. So in this Geology 101 lab book, if we get snowed out of a particular field trip, and we can't go out because the weather's too bad, then I say, well, well, we can't go out to Thorpe today, sorry, we're gonna do the San Andreas Fault lab instead. It's like a rainy day or snow day lab. And what we do is we give the students, this is at Central now, my school, we give them a topographic map of the Carrizo Plain, a particular segment and again, I'm, I'm designing this lab based on what Charlie is describing to me about what, what he kind of does. So this is old school now. This is, you know, more than 20 years ago. And we've got topo maps with contour lines and power lines and Jeep roads. But you can obviously see there's the San Andreas Fault, a major plate boundary coming right through. In fact, there are streams that are flowing out of the hills, and then the streams suddenly do this big, crazy zigzag. And when we go in the cozy fort, you'll see better images of it. Well, we don't have a cozy fort, especially 20 years ago. We didn't have the internet 30 years ago. So we would give our students these, these aerial photographs, and they would you know, line them up. And then they would start looking at these drainages. Let me, let me turn them around for you. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. You can do this. You can do this. What? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm overlapping the photos properly here. So you can see these are kind of overlapping sets. But the point is we have certain stream channels that are flowing directly across the fault. There's just a little bit of a zigzag to them as they cross. Remember, each time there's an earthquake, the Pacific plate suddenly lurches forth. But it turns out that these two streams here used to be connected to these two guys over here. So can I do this? Kind of. It used to be like this, and now it's like this. So these are actually bee-headed stream channels. They're dry. They don't have any water in them anymore because there's been a number of earthquakes to offset that stream system. So instead of using fences, you can actually use natural linear features to measure the offset. I'm spending time with you down at that level. I'm kind of setting you up for the cozy fort, basically. So the students, in an hour and a half or something, work through the photos. They actually truly slap their ruler down on the trace of the San Andreas Fault, and they measure between channels that they know used to be together, but now have been offset. So they measure in millimeters on the map. And then they use the scale of the map to convert the millimeters to ground distance. And then we give them the age of the actual channel. Let me see if I can find that. So they can figure out. Right. So we say here, I'll just read it to you. This is from Charlie now. Your, your two offset answers in meters on the previous page are the largest measurements of offset here at the Carrizo Plain. But not all offset measurements are in this ballpark. The smallest offset on an active channel here in the Carrizo Plain is eight meters. In other words, eight meters, 20, 24 feet, for one earthquake. Which means that for every earthquake that occurred here in the San Andreas Fault, the ground moves a minimum of eight meters. So then we ask them how many earthquakes, if we know the average offset, how many earthquakes are recorded if we have offset that stream channel by X amount? 
and then we give them the age of the channel. And that's a whole different process to figure out how long that channel's actually been there. Like, the stream hasn't always been there. But if we can give them the age of the channel, and in the case of the Carrizo Plain, the channel that we have the students work with is, that channel's been there for 3,700 years. Well, then they have a number of earthquakes, age of the channel, simple math, you figure out the recurrence interval, the average number of years between events. And then the last thing I have them do is to actually figure out how old they will be the next time a big earthquake will happen in that particular area. So my point is to show you that detail and to give you a sense that these are not guesses. This is based on data, of course, trenching, ages of stream channels, using some basic math on a particular segment, and doing something to forecast. But if you're waiting for a message that we know how to forecast earthquakes, I think you all know we don't, so we don't still know how to do that. And it's, it's a game of choosing your words carefully when you talk about the future, because the stakes are quite large. We can comment more on that if you like. Um, I'm going to continue to roll. I see comments coming in. If you're, if you're new to us, we're going to do some live Q&A, but I, I can't read your comments right now. We've got more than 1,000 here. Okay, we'll keep rolling. So I want to share some exciting, again, wrong word for this topic, sorry. Um, captivating footage from 1906. That's what I wanted to kind of talk about with the Carrizo plane, but we'll come back to it. Before we go into the Cozy Ford, I have two other things I want to comment on. I'm not flipping you off. Many know here in the Pacific Northwest, we have a rather dramatic rotation in a clockwise sense with crust throughout the Pacific Northwest, Washington, Oregon, Northern California. Let's go back to that other whiteboard. And I'm guessing you already noticed that I had that on here. So these green arrows, I'm not flipping you off. So we're doing individual segments of the San Andreas Fault, producing offset on occasion. It's frustrating, though, because some segments haven't done much in the last 200 years. Other segments have gone semi-regularly. Some segments appear to creep. In other words, they, they gradually slide and don't have this buildup of stress and ultimately strain in the rocks. So there's lots of variability along strike, along the trend of this San Andreas Fault. But regardless, the cumulative effect of eventually moving um, the Pacific Plate north, if you just think of it as, as 20 feet being released at a time, Again, we're going talking about centuries between events. The cumulative effect is taking a portion of North America, the leading edge of North America, and essentially being, this portion of North America is being influenced by this northwestward movement of the Pacific Plate. Likewise, the western portion of Washington and Oregon being influenced by the motion of the Juan de Fuca Plate. And as a result, because these two plates are doing their thing, regularly. This is, this is not stop and start. This is gradual. This is ongoing. 30 millimeters a year, every year, 30 millimeters a year. But we should be having 30 millimeters a year uh, along this San Andreas Fault, but it's stuck in most places. And you build up 30 millimeters a year of strain until you finally have a release and we do our 20 feet or 15 feet during an earthquake on the San Andreas Fault, but I'm getting sidetracked. The, the, there is a tie between our clockwise rotation up here and this motion on the San Andreas Fault. Although when I was thinking about this this morning, I had a new thought. I don't know how many years I've talked about the clockwise rotation. And it's possible I just woke up too early this morning and I'm not thinking clearly. But I think Ray Wells who is kind of the godfather of documenting this clockwise rotation before we had GPS, 
In other words, he has field geology evidence for this clockwise rotation around Pendleton, Oregon. I think he's got clockwise rotation going back 50 million years. 50 million years of clockwise rotation. But we don't have 50 million years of San Andreas Fault activity. So I think that might be a new thought for my brain. Why do we have 50 million years of clockwise rotation if we don't have 50 million years of San Andreas Fault? And are we sure we don't have 50 million years of San Andreas Fault? Yes. Freelancing. Freelancing. We've done this before in past uh, sessions, but this is my favorite diagram from my Geology 101 class that shows that the San Andreas Fault is born roughly 20 million years ago. And we'll see some animations from Tanya Atwater and Reed done by Jenda Johnson to show this. But we don't have a San Andreas Fault 40 million years ago, and yet Wells is telling us that we have some clockwise rotation as early as 50. I need to look that up, number one, make sure that's true, but I think that's right. So that's, 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 our, that's on my to-do list. Why is that? But as we do more and more of North America crossing these Pacific rise, we have more and more of a length of the San Andreas Fault until eventually we will have nothing but the San Andreas Fault along the west coast of North America. Our future here in Washington, 10 million years from now, will be a welcoming celebration of the San Andreas Fault coming up through us. No more volcanoes. The subduction will be gone. Last comment before we go to the cozy fort. You know that I love this, and it's not just me. A growing movement among research geologists are realizing that Baja BC, that a large portion of Baja Mexico is now up in British Columbia, and a little bit of it is in northern Washington. But that is possible if we look at these motions and this history and this 20 feet per earthquake story. But if we have, what is that? 25 million years worth of time? We're gonna be able to move almost 2,000 miles along San Andreas fault-like structures. Where'd it go? Here it is. When I talked about the Straight Creek Fault, which is a little bit younger than Baja BC, I'm scattered now, but I hope you can stick with us. Um, a neighbor of ours, uh, Kay, uh, who lost her husband, Tuck, a couple years ago, and Tuck was a loyal uh, attendee of all of, well, they both were, but Tuck in particular had a lot of interest in geology, and, and she was going through Tuck's stuff, and she just happened to drop this off at the house which actually was, now that I think of it, it's part of the reason we're doing this session this morning because uh, she gave me this that used to belong to Tuck, who Tuck we used to study down in, in California. And this is an important uh, quadrangle, an important geologic map done by Thomas Dibley, uh, who had spent a whole career studying a bedrock in the state of California, 60 years of field mapping. That's not an exaggeration. 60 frickin' years. And I think that's the first little thing I want to uh, read to you on the Cozy Fort. But before we go in there, um, this is an important quad because he's in Palo Alto. Some of you know that name. That's where Stanford University is located. And the San Andreas Fault runs very close to Stanford University. We're in the San Francisco Bay Area. Well, another segment, not the Carrizo Plain now, a different segment of the San Andreas Fault. So this is field work done in 1963. Let's pause. 1963. This is not a plate tectonic scene yet. We're years, even really a decade, before plate tectonics is fully embraced by the world. And yet Dibley is saying, here's my map. I've covered every 
square inch of the ground in the Palo Alto quadrangle Here's there's Stanford University. Thanks for the thanks for this gift, Kay. Uh, Mountain View, Sunnyside, Los Gatos, San Jose. Okay, Los Altos. And he's just making a map. He's not he's not trying to, you know, say anything about plate tectonics or anything. He's just saying, look, this is the map, man. And we've got rocks on this side of the, this fault. And he didn't discover the San Andreas Fault, you know, since 1906 at least. We knew about the San Andreas Fault existing. But he's saying this stuff that's on this side of the fault. In fact, look, he's uh, right here. The bedrock on both sides of the San Andreas Fault near Stanford University is so different. He actually did two different diagrams. He said, I got this stuff on one side. I'm not flipping you off. We got these rocks on, on the west side of the San Andreas Fault. We got these rocks on the east side of the San Andreas Fault. They have nothing to do with each other. And he was the first geologist as early as the 1953 season, I think. 1953 was the first time Dibley said, I don't know how it's possible, but I think this stuff got moved like 200 miles away from it where it used to be. There was no idea in 1953 how to explain that. But the understanding of plate tectonics, basic plate tectonic motion and tectonic plates and moving things hundreds of miles if given enough time all came from geologic maps like this. And Dibley was right in the middle of laying the groundwork for our understanding of not only how the San Andreas Fault works, but in a broader sense, how plate tectonics works. So in many ways, the San Andreas Fault is one of the key places, maybe the key place, mm, one of the key places to help us understand and crack the code on how the Earth works with this plate tectonics business. A huge revolution in science, as you all well know. All right. Not bad, 9.34. I think I've got easily 15 minutes in the cozy fort with you. Hope you're up for it. No big deal. Well, we may have a record number watching at the moment which probably means we have people who are thoroughly confused. I don't understand what's happening now. Well, my dad was a good dad, and we would make forts in the basement because he was a pack rat. He, had cardboard. he couldn't throw out a cardboard box to save his life. We made elaborate, my sisters and I, elaborate forts out of cardboard boxes in the basement. And he'd come down and hang out in our cozy forts with us. And that was his name, Cozy Forts. We'd have lunch in there. We'd have read books in there together. So this is my homemade little cozy fort in honor of my dad. Taking extra time because this is this is good stuff here. I think we're doing okay. And this is the part where people walk by the house going, Mommy, there's that man again. What is he doing? Oh, he's a little strange, dear. We don't really ask questions. He's a large man that appears to have lost his mind. Let's pray for him. It's Sunday morning. Oh, okay. We're getting rid of my voice. Mercifully, we're cranking the volume. Goodbye, live stream for the moment. Thomas Dibley, or Dibley. I'm just on Wikipedia here. I just want to tell you a little bit more about him. 
Uh, born in 1911, Santa Barbara, died in Santa Barbara, 2004, an American geologist best known for his geological mapping. He is also known, together with co-author Mason Hill, for the assertion in 1953 that hundreds of miles of lateral movement had taken place along the San Andreas Fault in California, an idea that was radical at the time, but which has been vindicated by later work and the modern theory of plate tectonics. Dibley was one of the most prolific field geologists in American history, and over a 60-year career in field mapping, including 25 years with the USGS, left a legacy of 40,000 square miles of geologic maps, covering approximately one-fourth of the state of California. <laughs> uh, Continuing a theme we've had before, where many of us love geology so much that we continue it after retiring. Dibley retired from the USGS in 1977. Let's see, he was 66 uh, years old. And the following year began mapping the geology of the Los Padres National Forest as a volunteer. Although retired, he mapped the geology of more than 3,000 square miles in the National Forest in his late 60s and early 70s. Uh, what can you say? Amazing stuff. Oh, God, where do I start? You know what? We're going to start with uh, old Scott. Scott, are you watching, Scott Cronk? Scott lives in Washington. I don't know, and he flies a drone occasionally. I don't know why you were down there, Scott, but you captured what I think is the best video of the San Andreas Fault. And I use it all the time, and I am grateful for your uh, uh, allowing me to show this. So Scott has a drone. This is five years ago. Scott's here, good, thank you, Scott. Actually, Scott, why were you down there? And did you, did you pick a certain time of, did you think out the time of day to get that shadow just right? Could you give us a little background on how you captured this? Because that shadow is perfect. We've got a delay here, Scott. Oh, you were on vacation. Did you luck out with that shade or did you figure out that was the best time of afternoon to grab it? The Pacific plates on the left, yes. So you thought it out, I mean, you needed perfect light, perfect um, time of night or afternoon. I mean, this supposedly is what the, San, uh, this, the Straight Creek Fault in uh, central Washington used to look like when it was still active. But it's been dead for 35 million years. And so, of course, you bury it, you erode those scars, but my God. And now that I'm looking at this with you, Oh, well, what's happened? Is that the end of it? I guess it is. There's probably more, Scott. Don't be mad at me. I think I just clipped it off there. Please don't be mad, Scott. Scott, can't we be friends? Scott, Scott, can't we be friends? Um, okay. I'm scattered. You know I'm scattered. 1984. I'm in Geology 101. And I remember watching this movie. Now, 1984... I'm in Weeks Hall, an auditorium in University of Wisconsin. Louis Maher is our instructor, professor. And you gotta load the film into the film projector, or maybe a grad student is doing that in the projection room in the back. Old timers, you know what I mean? You're taking the film, you're getting it into the projector. You know, it's like an old movie house, but that was what we were using in the classrooms. I, me as a student now. And in addition to seeing, remember, just the nostalgia coming back to watching this, this is called San Francisco, The City That Waits to Die. Made by a British outfit, I believe. You'll hear the narrator. But one of my memories is the professor, Maher, said he always gets choked up when he shows this because he sees the boys and the dog with the footage from Alaska. And I was like, wow, this professor is an actual human being. I never really imagined him having a life. Like I only thought he existed up there with the podium and everything. 
So that left us a big impression on me that this guy was willing to admit that he got emotional watching this. Kind of a weird memory, but anyway. Uh, I want to show a couple pieces of this to you. This is 1972, I'm guessing. Uh, there's excitement about discovering the San Andreas Fault, discovering plate tectonics, uh, and we'll show you one clip right now. A single earthquake as opposed to years of war. Possibly as many as 50 or 100,000 is within the range of probability. Scientists believe that many of these lives could be saved. The key to saving them is understanding the causes of earthquakes. To do this, they have returned to the 1906 earthquake, the most closely analyzed earthquake in the world. It shook over 50,000 square miles of California. And afterwards, scientists observed in country lanes and farmers' fields an extraordinary series of breaks in the ground. Photo by J.K. Gil uh, J. Gilbert. J.K. Gilbert. Need more coffee. Okay, we're going to do more of that. Don't, don't, be, don't be mad at me. The rupture stretched for over 200 miles. Oh, no. I jumped the gun. We're going to do it. Nineteen oh six, San Francisco. The rupture stretched for over two hundred miles, the longest surface break ever recorded. It followed the line of an ugly and unusual land formation that runs throughout California. Ugly? The San Andreas Fault. Not as good as you, Scott. Air, it looks as if someone had dragged a knife across the land, leaving a jagged linear scar. Geologists suggested that this marked a break in the Earth's crust, which plunged downwards for 20 to 30 miles. They didn't have a drone. The land surface, they argued, had ripped open because one side of the fault was trying to move northwards in respect to the other side. Pressures in the rocks had slowly built up until they were suddenly released like an uncoiled spring. The action of the rocks lurching past each other created the earthquake. This theory is now accepted. In 1906, the sudden movement tore apart farmers' fences by as much as 20 feet of the Californian Institute of Technology, Professor Clarence Allen. In some cases, we have been able to identify rock units that have been split by the fault, and we can now find the two halves of these rock units and see how far they are separated along the fault. For example, these two rocks I have in my hand are rocks taken from two different sides of the fault, 160 miles apart, but they are a very distinctive rock type, so similar, in fact, that we conclude that they must have at one time been together part of a single rock unit that was split by the fault and separated so that they now lie 160 miles apart along a branch of the San Andreas Fault in the southern part of the state. Now, is that movement going on today? Still continuing. Right. We have every reason to think that it is, not only from the... Can you, can you feel the excitement? I mean, they're making films, first of all. That's kind of new. There isn't a lot of this kind of field-based stuff, and they got the groovy music and all that at the early 70s. But it must have been an intoxicating time to be a geologist right there with these major revelations coming in almost weekly. And to give you a, a better sense of that, this cocky guy I always remember, think of, we kind of howled when he said it in 1984. I think, I think at least I remember us kind of laughing when he said it because we were watching this in 1984, the film, and it was made you know, 12 years earlier. Check out this old computer and what this guy says. 
measuring points like Mount Diablo, data on earthquakes and fault movements are sent back, often simultaneously, to the Earthquake Research Center near San Francisco. The problem is analyzing the data. A first step is to display it. Dr. Darrell Wood. Darrell Wood. It's not possible to locate earthquakes just a few seconds after they arrive. What we're trying to do is couple a display of this type to the very rapid detection of these earthquakes and thereby almost instantaneously display the information. What I would like to show for you, to you now would be all of the earthquakes that have occurred in the year 1969 plus two years, two months in 1970. The earthquakes will be seen on this plan view of California. The longest diagonal straight line on the left is the San Andreas Fault. It runs down from San Francisco Bay. The two smaller diagonal lines on the right are branches of the fault. The time will be condensed by a factor of 1 million to 31 seconds. We gotta stick with this. The dots that appear on the screen will be proportional to the size of the earthquake. If it is a large earthquake, it will be a large X. If it is a small earthquake, it will be a dot. The important thing to watch for are the patterns in the activity and where the earthquakes are occurring relative to these faults. I'd like to remind you that San Francisco is in the upper left-hand corner of the map. And you should also notice, as soon as we start the run, that the San Andreas Fault in the San Francisco region is not active. It's almost as if the fault is locked and refusing to yield its strain energy with the earthquakes. This lack of activity near San Francisco could very well be a very dangerous thing. All right, here we go. So he thinks he's on to something about predicting By now you've witnessed this fact that only a few very lonely earthquakes are occurring along the San Andreas Fault. The principal activity is on, along the southern area of the major faults. Muffler boy. This is longer than I wanted, but we got to get this proclamation from this guy. The next step is to display not earthquakes, but the small geophysical changes that precede large earthquakes, to display these as they happen, before the earthquakes occur. Yes, Colin, correct. Recently, a swarm of small earthquakes hit the town of Danville, which lies at the foot of Mount Diablo. To the residents of Danville, if they'd been in bed at the time, these earthquakes would have felt as if a 20-stone man was shaking the bed. The key to predicting such earthquakes is detecting the warning signs which precede them. 1972. And in this case, 13 hours before the Danville earthquakes, there was a series of geophysical events that appeared to give warning of the earthquakes themselves. Hidden away in the mountains and valleys along the San Andreas Fault, instruments detected these changes. Oh, come on. In particular, some showed that rock strata near San Francisco heaved or tilted 13 hours before the earthquakes. Here at the Stanford Linear Accelerator, one of the world's largest computers processed the data before the earthquakes took place and displayed it. From the top of the screen, a line will appear and point to the earthquake as the rocks actually tilt. Here it comes. Now the anomalous activity begins. The arrow is shortening, indicating tilt up, away from the fault. It is now starting to rotate in the direction of the epicenter and it's pointing to the earthquake. The tilt activity around the fault forces the tilt to go northward. That's the end of the sequence. What we need to do is have a system of this type that will allow us to cross-correlate this information in the, at, simultaneously while earthquakes are occurring. Are the Americans optimistic Here we go. after these first hopeful signs? If the San Francisco earthquake does not occur within the next five years, it's my opinion that we will be able to predict it. Here in the Japanese village of Matsushiro, scientists... Well, it's 40 years later, 50 years later, we still can't do it. And I know some of you are commenting, uh, Dutchiness can do it. Um, let's not go there. 
Uh, I'm sorry, that was way longer than I wanted. I, th I wanted to get his quote and move on, but maybe you saw something. I, I gotta show you this one. Uh, this program's running long, by the way, just in case you haven't figured that out. It's Sunday. I find this fascinating. This is, we're gonna look at this. It's three minutes and 26 seconds. Now to our news hour share, something interesting that caught our eye. In 1906, a massive earthquake and out of control fire devastated San Francisco. In 2017, a century-old film turned up at a California flea market. After seeing the discovery on Facebook, photo historian Jason Wright bought the film on a hunch that it might be long-lost footage of a crippled San Francisco shot two weeks after the quake. We recently spoke to Wright from his home in High Burton, England, about the secrets revealed in the now-restored film. In April 1906, a major earthquake struck San Francisco. The quake was very large in itself, but most of the, the damage was actually caused by fire, which ripped through the city. Whole sways of San Francisco were completely leveled and destroyed. We've known about this film for over 100 years, but it's more of a rediscovery. It's, uh, it's been lost all this time. What it actually is, is about one to two weeks Look after at that. the earthquake actually hit. It's uh, basically a trip down Market Street done by the Miles Brothers. And there's a famous uh, tape that most people have already seen, which went down Market Street um, just a couple days before the earthquake hit. The previous uh, footage of the trip down Market Street only survives because one of the Miles Brothers actually sent that footage over to their New York studio literally one day before the earthquake hit. This is a missing film of their trip back down Market Street once the earthquake had already happened. So it allows us to really compare and contrast basically Amazing. before and after and see the devastation that actually had gone on. All the hustle and bustle that you saw on the, the previous uh, trip down Market Street, that's all kind of gone and people are quite kind of down and kind of shuffling around, you know, all the pomp and all the rich people going past in their, their expensive cars, that's completely gone now. As you move down Market Street, you see most of the buildings are gone at this point, and you see a lot of ancient steam uh, engines. They used to put chains around the buildings and pull the buildings down using the steam engine. As you get down towards the bottom of Market Street, though, you get to the ferry building, and this is the most important part of the film for me. You see the, the human cost of the actual tragedy. You see a lot of people basically in line, you know, from rich to poor, everybody, and they're waiting for ferries and boats to take them out of the disaster area. And then towards the end of the movie, it flicks through a few more scenes. You see dynamiting taking place, um, you know, City Hall being blown up, for example, which is a bit disconcerting, and then the demolition of Prager's department store. I wanted to bring this to the people of San Francisco. I wanted to make sure we conserved it for future generations because I think it's very important. With this film, you see the human element Amazing. of, of Amazing. what happened. Disaster. I thought that was really cool. Hope you did too. Uh, we're going to continue. I'm getting hot in here, man, but we're going we're gonna to do a few more. Uh, I saw Oscar's name. Oscar, thank you for sending me the link. I didn't know about this till I opened it up this morning, so thank you for the email. I don't know anything about this guy. This is a, I'll show you what the channel looks like first of all. This is, yeah, it's live. So are you aware of this? Uh, if you look in the lower left, you'll see the YouTube channel. CA Seismograph. And it's a 24-hour, seven days a week stream uh, showing seismic data. I don't know anything more than that. And I, I, I know that many are, are consumed by monitoring earthquakes uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. And um, there are many channels, I assume, like this. But again, there's the YouTube channel in the lower left. And uh, just wanted to share that with you. I don't know anything more. Oscar, you can chime in if you know more or if you're affiliated somehow with that, uh, with that group. Uh, I'm, I'm all over the place now, but you already knew that. Here's a map of Point Reyes, a geologic map of Point Reyes National Monument or National Seashore, something like that. We're north of San Francisco now. 
Liz and I were down there for a wedding a couple summers ago, actually Scott Brady's kid's wedding in San Jose, and we spent a really wonderful day up in Point Reyes, and you see the pink there and the red. Well, first of all, you notice the San Andreas Fault coming right through, so look at the, look at the shape of this thing. That's the trend of the San Andreas Fault coming right through, which means that this is the Pacific Plate side, which means this is granite that should be down at the southern tip of the Sierra Nevada mountains. And it's been moved more than 300 miles, one earthquake at a time, 20 feet at a time. But if you have 20 million years, you can do quite a bit of offset. So if you only go one place, well, I don't know about California details, so I'll keep my mouth shut. But this is a famous place among geologists, Point Reyes. R-E-Y-E-S. The hits keep on a coming. What's this? Oh, this is a, another little old film from the early 70s that actually visits the Carrizo Plain. I didn't know this existed. I would have used this in my lab if I had known it existed, but I found it. Uh, Bijou woke me up at 4.30 this morning, so I was finding all this stuff at about 5 this morning. The road intersects the fall zone. Rock on the face of the road cut is contorted and twisted by the compression of two huge sections of earth squeezing together. Changes like this take place very slowly. The awesome forces that come into play are rarely experienced directly by man. But proof of motion along the fault is here in the geologic record of the land. Here we go. One of the most dramatic examples of this proof can be found in the Carrizo Plain, where the dry gullies of drainage creeks descend to the fault line. Those are the gullies that we've been teaching about. Ruby music. These streams do not flow in a straight line. At the fault, they veer sharply to the north. The offset of this stream is the result of motion along the fault. Oh, I'm tripping right now. This model shows how the offset was produced. Do it. Land on the western side of the fault has been moving slowly northward with relation to the eastern side. Yes. Where the stream crossed the fault trace, this horizontal motion diverted the flow. That's really well done. Further motion completely interrupted the stream's path. Of course, they're showing creep. It's not that gradual, but you get the idea. Eventually, the waters of the stream eroded a new path into the land. But again, the new stream was offset. By God, that's well the done. Fall. They did a great job with that. Today, the stream is displaced about 20 meters to the right where it crosses the fault line. This offset is probably the result of several hundred years of fault motion. Several hundred years of fault motion. They were a little bit off on that one, but otherwise, terrific stuff. Okay, it's 10 o'clock. We're gonna to come to your live q and I feel like I got one more thing to show you. What is it? Now I'm hunting around. Oh, of course. Is that it? Yeah. The last thing I wanna show you, we pull back to geologic time again. We pull back to the last 20 million, I feel like Randy Lewis now. We pull back and we pull back and we have Jenda Johnson, remember her? Animator in Portland taking an older animation by Tanya Atwater, remember her, Santa Barbara? And folding it into work with Bob Butler. I'll let this speak for itself, but it involves Gulf of California, opening of the Gulf of California, showing how complicated the motion can be along the San Andreas Fault, instead of the rather simplistic view that you've heard from me so far. This is three minutes and I promise we're out of the cozy fort. I can barely breathe as it is, so we're, I need to get some fresh air, but I, I can hold on for three more minutes. Jenda Johnson, do it. Earthquakes are common in the Gulf of California, continuing in a fairly linear trend southeastward from the state of California. Stepping back, we see that these earthquakes define the southwestern margin of the North American plate between California and Middle America. Here, we'll focus on the Gulf of California rift zone. 
a divergent margin, which is propagating into California. It is a transitional corridor that connects the East Pacific Rise Spreading Ridge to the south with the San Andreas Fault Zone in California. Extension and strike slip faulting are causing Baja California to separate away from mainland Mexico, thereby opening the Gulf of California as though it were being unzipped. <laughs> in reality, the waters of the Gulf of California hide connecting stair-stepping seafloor spreading ridges with right lateral strike slip motion on classic transform faults. This collection of faults and ridges forms a continental rift system that is tearing the Pacific plate apart from the North American plate. If we zoom in, we can see the processes occurring. As the lithospheric plates move apart, heat rises beneath the mid-ocean ridge. Magma forms at shallow pressures and creates new rock at the spreading ridges. The plates move away in conveyor belt-like fashion. Movement between the ridges is accommodated by transform faults where large earthquakes occur due to friction between the plates. Smaller earthquakes also occur along the ridges. Backing out to map view, we see the simplified San Andreas Fault Good. System cutting through California. As the movement of the plates continues along this plate boundary, it is forcing Baja California away from Mexico and causing Santa Barbara and San Diego to migrate northward and toward the, San Francisco. The Giants and the Dodgers will be cross-time rivals region, once again. For a more detailed look, we will go back 20 million years to watch how the Gulf and coastal areas developed. Good, do it. Nice. This animation by Tanya Atwater shows a tectonic model for the 20 million year evolution of the region, depicting the rotation of the transverse range blocks, the breakup of the continental shelf, as well as the opening of the Gulf of California as the Pacific Plate grinds northward against the North American Plate. The Baja California Peninsula and most of southwestern California is a remnant of the North American continent that was sheared off and moved to its present position. Earthquakes in the Gulf are more of a nuisance than a threat. However, the on-land part of this spreading ridge extends into Baja California, Mexico, and the Imperial Valley of California, okay. where it is transitioning from ridge transform Woo! to the continental boundary. Thank you, Jenda. That was a long, cozy fort, longer than I wanted, but most of you are still with us. Thank you. Does that really say 1,200 people? I mean... Yeah, 1,200? Nice. You love you some earthquakes. It's time for live Q&A. Uh, you know that I'm a Washington guy, but I will do my best to address things. And we have plenty of California viewers this morning, so they may be able to uh, answer some of your stuff directly or correct me. I'm fine with that. So let me uh, find the live stream again. Oh, I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad I'm in here. It is, it's cooking out there. Hopefully Liz has some rocks in her pockets. Popping out the chat like a boss, going to live chat instead of top chat because that's how I roll. I'm muted mercifully. He scrolls back in real time looking for uppercase, looking for auto lock uppercase, Evelyn H7. How can only part of a huge fault move or slip to cause an earthquake? It's possible, Evelyn, because uh, the crust is kind of elastic. It can store energy. So if you think, if I was really strong, Evelyn, this was one of our wooden blocks, right, Evelyn? If I was really super strong, like, like incredibly, like impossibly strong for a person, I could take this wooden block and I could so squeeze it so hard, Evelyn, that it would actually start to squish a little bit like a, like a marshmallow. Can you imagine a wooden block acting like a, like a marshmallow? Like it actually can change its shape just a little bit. And so that's kind of the view of the bedrock along the San Andreas Fault. If you, if you have, uh, let's say, 100 miles of the San Andreas Fault slip, 
it doesn't mean that the entire length of the fault ruptures and a bunch of that energy then gets transferred to crust nearby. I think physically that's the wrong way to explain it, but I'm, I'm spitballing as we go, Evelyn. I guess another way to answer your question is, it's maybe difficult to explain how it's possible, but it's important to say we have all sorts of very careful field evidence to say that it has happened that way. That there's these individual segments that have ruptured. We've seen that in historic times, and we've, through that trenching, we've seen prehistoric evidence as well. Age seven, Evelyn, you're a superstar. Uh, Rien, or Regine, how many millions, how many million years it will take Los Angeles to move to Alaska? Well, interesting question. So the punchline, again, we're back to sports fans. You know, back in New York, the Giants and the Dodgers were crosstown rivals. And now the, the, the Dodgers play here and the Giants play here. But in 20 more million years, we're going to have this motion of this portion of the crust. And so we are going to slide Los Angeles up to San Francisco and the Dodgers and the Giants will be cross-town rivals again. Ha, 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 ha. But as you heard me briefly say, the, the days of the Juan de Fuca plate subducting beneath the Pacific Northwest will not go on forever because North America as a whole continues to drift west and will cr eventually cross the Juan de Fuca Ridge, which is generating the Juan de Fuca plate. And so we will, uh, 30 million years, if we could all come back 30 million years from now, wouldn't that be fun, number one? And number two, we can come and see that there's one big master San Andreas fault connecting the San Andreas as we know it with the Denali. Excuse me. Excuse me. I don't know what that was. So to answer your question, uh, uh, 100 million years. Los Angeles to Alaska. Wild guess, but... Uh, 20 million years just to get L.A. to San Francisco. Thank you for your question. Robert, why doesn't lava come up from the fault between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate? Thanks for your question. Lava does come up in Nevada where we have normal faults, where we have crust being relaxed, crust being thinned, crust being broken, and we get... Uh, um, uh, a rift valley uh, in the process. But with the San Andreas, because we're really not extending the crust, we're just doing this lateral motion, remember? We're doing this. There's just not a, the, the, the crust is still thick and the crust is not being relaxed or extended or thinned. And so it's just not possible for that magma to come to the surface. So yes, it's a rare plate boundary, Robert, to have earthquakes, but no volcanoes. We have earthquakes at all types of plate boundaries. And we have volcanoes at most types of plate boundaries, but not transform like the San Andreas and not uh, two continents colliding either. Uh, thanks for all these questions. Susie, could Long Valley actually be the result of a hotspot that was formed two million years ago? A theory of hotspot form, forming new caldera to the east in Nevada. The Long Valley caldera uh, is puzzling to me and I think to most, maybe to all. Um, there is, in eastern California, an incredible caldera, the Long Valley caldera, a super volcano that exploded what is it, 760,000 years ago, I think? And I know of no hotspot trail or any indication of a major heat source like the Yellowstone story. So if there is a track where a hotspot used to be offshore and now it's beneath Eastern California, I'm unaware of that. I don't think anybody's aware of it. So I don't know what to do with that. I, I would do probably a program on the Long Valley and the Bishop Tuff and all the wonderful stuff, Mono Craters, all that stuff, but I don't think we know that much about that area. Maybe a, maybe a California geologist does. Um, 
No, Tanya Atwater and Brian Atwater are not related. Isn't that weird? Two of our most important North American geologists in the last 50 years, no relation. Kathy in Brisbane, can you explain the uh, kind of Santa Barbara rotation? I really can't. Um, that's Tanya's, I always, I always want to call her Tanya. That's Tanya's animation based on detailed mapping in the Santa Barbara area. And that's where she lives and has worked for most of her career. So there's no questioning that rotation happened, but I don't, I, I don't know why that rotation happened there. I, I, I really have no insight for you, I'm sorry. Uh, Adam, how far into the Pacific Plate does the Mendocino Ridge go? That is something I've meant to do. Oh, I was going to read this to you. Uh, let me answer your question first, and then I'll read this to you. Oh, I was going to go here. Maybe if you just go to Google Maps, and you look carefully at Cape Mendocino, look at these fractures. Look at those fractures. Now, this is Cape Mendocino. I'm, again, I'm looking backwards into the phone. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. So I don't really know if, if that's technically the San Andreas Fault or if that's the Mendocino fracture zone that's different or it's one and the same. But I don't understand the significance of those guys, as well as I've never really understood the details of the submarine canyons. They're so huge, and the explanations that are out there just, they don't work for me. Uh, so another reason to be interested is, I think it's a thing, now I'm spitballing, you know, I think it's a thing that tsunami that crossed the ocean are influenced by something like this. And it's not an accident that Crescent City, California gets hammered by tsunami because of that fracture zone on the floor. I, I mean, I'm totally confused by all of that. But I, I think there's something going on there. I've always meant to look into it. That's my best answer, which wasn't an answer at all, really, Adam. But it is an area that I, I'm intrigued by, and I've kind of reminded that I, I might, I don't know, maybe I'll do a live stream on that. Tim, it seems that Southern California could eventually separate from the mainland just like Baja California. Oh, I agree, Tim, but not on a Tuesday morning, not on third person Thursday. And there are certainly people that are firmly of the belief that Southern California is just going to plop into the ocean. But I 100% I agree with you that if we address fault motion, we talk about tens of millions of years, that is for sure. We're going to create a new exotic terrain, and it's going to be headed towards Alaska or Japan. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, if you've been with us for exotic terrains, and if I haven't said this before, we're witnessing the birth of an exotic terrain. This is how you can get continental crust riding on an ocean plate. This, we're, we're starting to lose a valuable piece of our real estate for really the first time. We've been receiving pieces of land, exotic terrains, for the last 200 million years. It's about time we give back, and we are with Baja. I don't know if we didn't ask them permission, or they didn't ask us permission, or whatever. Uh, so many questions now. Oh, Goldfinger, okay. I jotted out a couple notes. Hang on, let me find them. So there's always new things to learn. And if you recall, we had a great earthquake session, and we were talking about evidence for great earthquakes along the Cascadia subduction zone, and the evidence was Brian Atwater finding uh, evidence for sudden land level change on shore, and then Chris Goldfinger with marine vessels and sending cores into things called turbidites, which are deposits from underwater landslides offshore. 
And those are the two ways that we can read the history of how many big earthquakes we've had in Cascadia. And I shared with you that the evidence that Atwater has and the detailed evidence that Goldfinger has doesn't totally match up as far as dates are concerned. So um, that's still kind of a work in progress. But Goldfinger has brand new evidence, and he presented this in December at the big AGU meeting, the American Geophysical Union meeting, a huge geology meeting, this is before the virus, December of 2019, and he presented uh, a, a new paper that says he has eight, uh, seven new cores in turbidites uh, just north of Cape Mendocino, underwater, and seven new cores with turbidites just south of Cape Mendocino. In other words, he's right in the vicinity of the triple junction, looking carefully at underwater landslides he interprets from earthquakes, here with Cascadia and here with the northern segment of the San Andreas Fault. And he has found these unusual two-layered turbidites. Again, turbidites are underwater landslide deposits, and his interpretation of his unusual two-layered turbidites is that he's starting to think he has evidence for a Cascadia event off the coast of Southern Oregon and Northern California, I'm going to say it, triggering an earthquake on a completely different type of a plate boundary north of San Francisco. He says, I've got evidence for eight of these things. Eight earthquakes that happened on Cascadia and then followed shortly by Northern San Andreas Fault. This is brand new. This is doomsday stuff. This is talking about our two biggest earthquake faults along the entire west coast of North America interacting and triggering each other. Again, his evidence is interpreted as Cascadia, if it's, if it's south enough and big enough, then kicks off a transform earthquake in the northern San Andreas Fault System. As usual, we're all skeptical in science by nature, and this is a brand new set of ideas. I think he first proposed this in 2008, and now he's got this new paper in 2019. So we'll see where that data goes, and where that evidence goes, and where uh, continuing work happens. But is there a connection? Is there a potential link between Cascadia quakes and San Andreas fault quakes? It's possible, according to Gold, Chris Goldfinger out of Oregon State University. The transverse range caused by the shear caused... Okay, you're just answering somebody's question, James. Yeah, there's some reverse faults in the Elliott Basin that's responsible for creating the, uh, the oil fields there, the oil reserves. And so there's reverse faults in the Elliott Basin basically as... There's kind of a bend in the San Andreas Fault here near Los Angeles. And so you can imagine this piece of continental crust that's riding on the Pacific Plate having a hard time getting around this bend. Since the San Andreas Fault is not straight, uh, there's compression of this crust, and so we're shortening the crust. And the Northridge earthquake in L.A. in 1994 uh, was not on the San Andreas Fault proper, but was on a blind reverse fault, a reverse fault we didn't even know about. That's how <laughs> you can get pretty discouraged uh, if you really get into the detail of what we know and what we don't know about this system. While we're at it, it's more than just one fault. So the Hayward Fault is what that guy was talking about with his old computer. The Hayward Fault, there's all these branches coming off of the main San Andreas. Even the Walker Lane and Owens Valley, there's, if you think about it on a long enough time frame, it's appearing, I used to work with Jeff Lee here, and Jeff would be mapping down in the mine of deflection and all these little valleys near Tonopah and Hawthorne, Nevada, sending students down there and making new geologic maps, and they're seeing that some of the plate interaction, some of the, the, the transform plate boundary activity is being 
gradually transferred over to Eastern California and Western Nevada. And from his work and other work, it looks like maybe in the next few million years, we'll have a transfer or a jumping of the position of the San Andreas Fault. I don't know that much about that, but that's the role of the Walker Lane. And I, I, again, I'm really, I'm really all over the place, but we have had some earthquakes just since we've been doing these live streams. There was one in San Francisco. Sorry, there was one in the Salt Lake City area. There was an earthquake in, uh, up by Stanley Basin in Idaho. There was one in the Walker Lane. And I've gotten you know, tons of emails, and I'm sure most geologists have gotten questions about that. If you take the time to look at all these events, all these earthquakes, and have a, a big enough sample size and, and magnitudes, and you, you kind of plot all that in your mind, um, we, are, we naturally want to you know, find some trends and some patterns and, and say that things are getting worse or we're leading up towards something. And yes, we cannot forecast earthquakes, but statistically, there's nothing unusual um, if you look at a grand uh, scale of seismicity over the last 130 years, as long as we've been studying them. Gary, how thick are the lithospheric plates along the San Andreas Fault? About the same on both sides? Generally, yes. Lithospheric plates, tectonic plates in general, are 100 kilometers thick. 100 kilometers thick, about 60 miles down. So that's maybe the simplest thing to say, is that the San Andreas Fault is not just a normal crack that goes down a 10 miles. It goes down 100 miles and is a significant tectonic boundary. I'm way back at 1014 and you're at 1022, so I'm about 10 minutes behind. Oh, good Lord, yeah. Let, let's, do, let's do 10 more minutes and we're done. This is fun, but I mean, whatever. Yes, Colin, Creep and Hollister. Oh, that was a clip I wanted to show. I guess it was in one of those. Yeah, there's, famously, there's curbs uh, in streets in Hollister that are just slightly offset. There's sidewalks that are just slightly offset. Like not broken cleanly like the fence thing, but just gradually bent. So the variability along the trend of the San Andreas Fault, rock type wise, geometry wise, um, there's so many variables that, that we're not doing what the guy on the, what the old computer said. What did he say? By you know, I'm confident by 1980 we'll have, be able to forecast earthquakes. Well, here we are. I don't know if we've made a whole lot of progress since then, to be honest. That's maybe not fair to say that, but as a teacher, that's kind of how I present it. Major leaps forward up here, by the way. And when they're making that film down there and they showed that footage from Alaska, that was a great earthquake. That was a, a, a locked zone becoming unlocked and tsunami. Nobody knew anything about those great earthquakes, that, those mechanisms, until Brian Atwater did that work in the mid-1980s. Captain Ned says, come on, Dutch and others forecast quakes. Uh, Captain, uh, with all due respect, uh, I, I just don't think those guys are being honest and true to all the evidence that's out there. And I'm just trying to report the data that we have. Uh, uh, let's not. Let's not. Is there any evidence of slow earthquakes along the San Andreas? Interesting question, Oscar. I know of no evidence of that. So we did an accession with Walter Zaliga on slow earthquakes in the Cascadia subduction zone, and there was something going on below the lock zone, kind of a transition zone where there must be some fluids or something. I know of nothing like that on the San Andreas. I'm scrolling backwards now. Could the Sharon, could the Pacific Plate in Southern California drift into Western Arizona causing the volcanoes? Drift into Western Arizona. Well, to get volcanoes, Sharon, we either need subduction, where two plates are colliding, or we need massive uh, extension, like the Basin and Range Province. 
And we have neither currently with the San Andreas, and I don't see that changing. Even if the San Andreas shifts over to Eastern California, it's still going to be transformed in nature. So no, I don't see new volcanoes or a major change in the type of plate boundary happening in the next few tens of millions of years. Uh, smiling llamas. How many discrete sections of the San Andreas Fault that slip at different times? I don't have a great answer. Maybe somebody does. I'm just familiar with uh, 101 textbooks that show half a dozen different segments. Uh, there may be a dozen different segments that have different character and different histories. Uh, I will say I I'm pretty confident we've made significant progress in inventorying past earthquakes. You know that's something that I like to talk about where we, to be able to look to the forward at all, we need a, a, a nice, well, just like in anything, history is going to teach us you know, how, to, how to look to the future. So with all those trenching efforts and other uh, investigations, we know a lot more about past earthquakes going back thousands of years. So that's progress. Oh, there's a lot of Dutch talk now. Okay. I'm open to everybody. I'm open to everything. If it's honest, scientific work. Can't cherry pick what you want to talk about. Colin, Baja has been, oh, you're answering somebody. Steve, has a fault slip ever been filmed as it happened? Interesting question. On the San Andreas, I assume you mean. No, I, I think I would have seen it by, if it has happened. If, if somebody knows of that, I'd be very interested. But it makes an interesting, that's really an interesting question. Like, God forbid, there's a big earthquake in, oh, I don't even want to say a town, but there's a big earthquake in a place on the San Andreas, and there's, you know, real-time traffic cameras or something, and you can see that off-ramp uh, get offset by 20, uh, 20 feet, hopefully at 3 in the morning when nobody's out there. Wow, yeah, amazing. Great question. Never thought about that before. Let's do three more and we're done. Liz is making breakfast. Or lunch? Brunch? It smells like eggs and cheese to me. Braden, how has the mouth of the Colorado River been affected by the movement of the Pacific Plate? So there's lots to look at on this map, and I don't use this, I love this map, but it's got too much glare typically for our camera. The mouth of the Colorado. So the Colorado today, the Colorado River is coming through the Grand Canyon, Lake Mead, dams of course, the Colorado, the mouth of the Colorado emptying into the Gulf of California. Mouth, mouth of California, mouth of the Colorado River going into the Gulf of California. What's your question again? How has the mouth of the river been affected by the movement of the Pacific Plate? I don't know, but I can guess. The, as we continue developing the San Andreas Fault, with, with, with uh, Jenda's zipper, she was showing you that this whole gulf is younger than 10 million years, maybe even younger than 5 million years old. And so we've kind of unzipped this gulf, meaning we're continuing to uh, lengthen this body of water as we, well, now we're getting into details I don't know. So kind of a half-baked half answer in honor of The Graduate, 1967, one of my favorite movies, half-baked is that the, maybe the mouth of the Colorado was, was further south when the gulf was smaller. But as the gulf enlarges, the mouth of the Colorado has enlarged, uh, migrated north as well. But I know of no major shift like the Colorado River used to flow like that way into Mexico and now has been captured by the gulf. I don't know of that as a, as a thing. 
Kyle House, one of my favorite USGS geologists, Dr. Jerk on Instagram, uh, is the specialist with the lower Colorado. He'd have an answer for you. Zarina, can the pressure buildup prior to breakage be enough to cause metamorphism? I don't think so. Even though we're talking about a lot of pressure and hundreds of years, we need way more pressure over millions of years to truly develop uh, metamorphic rock through dynamothermal or, or, or burial metamorphism. Thanks for the question. It's past 1030. I got to quit. I got to quit. Michael Steffen, oh, you're back. You couldn't handle yesterday and now you're back. God did an amazing job creating his earth. Thank you. A toast to all of you, including Michael. Thank you for sticking with us to the end of this extended program. Here's to your health. The health of your parents. The health of your grandparents, if they're still with you. The health of your children your grandchildren, your extended family and friends. Here's to us. I won't see you Monday, Tuesday night at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Love to have you back. It's supposed to be a rainy one, so I'll probably be inside here again, going to John Stockton's house. Wednesday night, George Beck, Petrified Wood, Ginkgo Park, Central Washington University. Thursday, Israel Russell, the first geologist making elaborate geologic maps back in the vintage of George Otis Smith. I want to learn about him. I don't know anything, but somebody help me emailed me amazing links to his original work, so thank you for that. Saturday morning, hoping to go out and do a field trip in our valley here for you. It's kind of a crapshoot. It's hard to call the weather, and especially the wind, a week out, but we'll, we'll cross our fingers. And then next Sunday morning, I've got to do my homework, but enough people are asking about paleomagnetism that I'll try to deliver something for you all. I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question. I know there were a lot there, but I did my best to reach as many of you as possible. Regardless of your age and your background, I salute you. I love you. I'm glad you're with us. Not only tonight, not only tomorrow night, but Tuesday night when I see you next. Thanks for tuning in. I love you. Goodbye.